Honoring the past as we look toward the future. Join WSAV in celebrating black history. This is Georgia's Black History Journey. Now, here's Kim Gusby. Hello, I'm Kim Gusby. Thanks for joining us. Next month will mark the 50th anniversary of a moment that would define the civil rights movement of the South and change the course of history. The March on Selma, Alabama and the moments leading up to that fateful day are now chronicled on the big screen in an Oscar nominated film. But did you know that there are a few local connections? Here's more. It sparked outrage around the world, igniting an international call for change. March 7, 1965 would go down in history as one of the most horrific and volatile events in the fight for freedom, earning the name Bloody Sunday. On that day, some 600 marchers from across the country assembled in Selma en route to Montgomery, Alabama. They were stopped short of the Edmund Pettus Bridge. George Shinhoster had worked with Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and others in Selma prior to that day. And I have the opportunity of listening and sitting at your feet, so to speak, to Dr. King and listening to those kind of remarks. You know, if a man hasn't something for which he's willing to die, he's not fit to live. I, I think 50 years later, I can be, a little, be somewhat philosophical. Then I was just, just ready to get up and be a part of a movement that was exactly that. It was a movement, but it was also something of a vortex that would sick you in and pull you in and you could you could go be and do. Shinhoster wasn't in Selma on Bloody Sunday, but another Savannian was, Amelia Boynton. Mrs. Boynton was one of the founders for the uh, Dallas County Voters League and a, and a dynamo even at that age. And this was long before any of the national organizations went to Selma. Often referred to as the matriarch of the voting rights movement, Boynton began fighting for voting rights in the poorest parts of Alabama in the 1930s, shortly after leaving Savannah. In the 1960s, she opened her home for planning sessions and provided shelter for fellow activists, including a young Shinhoster. Her house was a pivotal place, as I recall. When I first went to Selma, that's where we went. When the movement began to pick up steam, it was Boynton who encouraged Dr. King and the Southern Christian Leadership Conference to join the cause. We must march. We must stand up. You march those people into rural Alabama, it's got to be open season. Her role as a civil rights pioneer is depicted in the movie Selma and the moment she nearly lost her life. This picture has become an iconic image of what would transpire. Boynton beaten unconscious and left in the street. Broken but not defeated, she and others would organize yet another march just two weeks later. And in less than five months, a symbol of success as President Lyndon Johnson signed the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Their cause must be our cause too. It was a major victory that Shinhoster says puts the battle for equality into perspective. There's, a, there's an adage that uh, nothing is as strong as an idea whose time has come. And if you were in the black belt of Alabama, where there was so much oppression that had already transpired, and there were people there whose ideals was enough is enough. In 2011, Boynton returned to Savannah. News 3 was there as she spoke to students at Savannah State University. She shared these words with the next generation. We have come a long way, but we've got a longer way to go. In business, in professions, and everything, we can't stop. And she has it. At 103 years old, she continues to fuel others with the same fire that has always burned inside of her. She endured, she knew the risks, she knew the challenges, and she faced them, she met them head on, and she had the kind of persistence that I wished I could have even more so, you know. And she has, uh, and she's triumphed. Although Mrs. Boynton is perhaps best known as the woman at the front of the March on Selma, what many may not know is that she also played a role in the women's suffrage movement. She knew George Washington Carver, and in 1964, she was the first African-American woman and the first female Democratic candidate to run for Congress in Alabama. Speaking of great Savannians, a local barber with a remarkable talent whittled his way into history. Ulysses Davis was a self-taught artist 
The late sculptor's collection is now considered one of the most important of African-American art in the country. As Milton Davis looks over the broken down structure he used to call home, his mind's eye brings back far different memories. Once adorned with carved and painted decorations, it has since fallen into disrepair. He had it all, you know, with decorated like and all, so it looked, well, I hate to see it like this, but it looked real, real good, you know. This is where his late father, famed sculptor and local barber Ulysses Davis spent most of his time, cutting hair and carving wood. I wait with time, I take my time, and in time I finish. It's funny, he, said he called it whittling, you know. It wasn't carving, it was whittling to him. A native of Fitzgerald, Georgia, Davis moved his family to Savannah in 1942 to work as a blacksmith's assistant. When he was laid off in the early 50s, he began barbering in a shop he built in the back of this West 45th Street home. In his spare time, he whittled, a hobby he picked up when he was just a boy. Soon, his shop was filled with his reliefs and freestanding carvings. People began to take notice of his craft and his barber shop became a makeshift museum. The people that came in and, and uh, got haircuts, they had a, uh, they really was treated to the work because he had shells all around the barber shop. Word of this unusual shop spread and caught the ear of local art teacher and artist Virginia Kaya. Through her efforts, Davis gained local and eventually national attention. In 1977, he presented President Jimmy Carter with a hand-carved bust, now on permanent display in the Presidential Library. And in 1982, he was honored by President and Mrs. Ronald Reagan. Over 60 years, Davis would create more than 300 works of art, rarely parting with any of his pieces. He said his art wasn't to be sold, it was to be admired. And he said, I would like for my work to be in a place where my great, great, great grandchildren could see it. With the help of historian and the local civil rights activist W.W. Law, that dream would come into fruition. Today, the Savannah Beach Institute is the permanent home for the Ulysses Davis Folk Art Collection. When you see Mr. Davis' pieces, it's like they're telling you a story beyond your imagination. Darlene Wilson is the interim director. Here, only a portion of the more than 230 works owned by the museum are on exhibit, including furniture and sculptures that reflect deep faith, humor, and heritage. You have Greek culture, you'll see the one eye cyclops that's hanging on the wall, and you have the lizards, which is from the Asian culture, and he also highlight the African culture as well with the various tribal ceremonial masks. It's home to Davis's masterwork, a series of 40 carved busts of the United States presidents from George Washington to George H.W. Bush. Pieces of his life are also on display, from his original barber chair to his signature pipe and handmade carving tools. Milton Davis says his father would be proud to see that such a fuss was being made over what he considered a hobby. His hope now was that the home where his father once made a living cutting and carving will someday be saved and, like his art, put on display for everyone to see. We'll be right back. Many of us are familiar with the story of 40 acres and a mule, a promise to newly freed slaves to provide a form of reparations following the Civil War. It was a promise that would go largely unfulfilled. But did you know Savannah is where that promise was made? It was the first time in America that blacks met with white leaders to discuss their future after slavery. These three black Baptist churches and these ministers and deacons had a big say in what became known as 40 Acres and a Mule in American history, not Savannah's history, not African-American history, not Southern history, American history. They gathered January 12, 1865 at what is now known as the Green Meldrum House in downtown Savannah, General Sherman's headquarters during the siege of the city. It is a long oval table. There is General Sherman, 
William T. Sherman. And right next to him is Secretary of War Edwin Stanton. And next to him is Ulysses Houston, the pastor of Third African Baptist Church, which is now the First Bryan Baptist Church. Also there was the pastor of First African Baptist Church, Reverend William Campbell, the Reverend John Cox of Second African Baptist, and standing up addressing the meeting was Garrison Frazier. About six feet, one inches tall in stature, an imposing black man who was a spokesman. Dr. Charles Elmore is a local historian and professor of humanities at Savannah State University. He says it was after that meeting that General Sherman issued Special Field Order Number 15. Which said this, that all of the Confederate uh, plantations that were seized during the Civil War, from Fernandina Beach to the St. John's River, from Jacksonville to Jekyll Island, St. Simons, the Golden Isle, clear to Tybee. Each black would receive 40 acres and an army mule to work the land. Hence, they called it 40 acres and a mule. Sherman is said to have made that announcement to the masses here on the steps of Savannah's Second African Baptist Church. Across the way in Green Square, more than 1,500 blacks gathered to listen in. And now these were people now who wanted to stand independent. You know what I'm saying? So upon hearing that news that we're going to get our own land and the tools to work that land, this is like the day of Jubilee. Freed slaves welcomed the order as proof that emancipation would give them a stake in the land they had worked as slaves for so long. But it only lasted for a while. And after that meeting, it is true that the Reverend Ulysses L. Houston, the ninth pastor of what is now First Bryan Baptist Church, led 1,000 blacks to Skidaway Island, where the landings is now located. They would stay for only a year. But it was rescinded now by Andrew Johnson. You know, he campaigned to remove the Union, and since it was a military order, once the Union was removed, we had no protection. To this day, there's still talk about black reparations in America, but often there's little said about where it began. January 12th marked the 150th anniversary of Sherman's Special Field Orders No. 15. Now a historical marker sits in Savannah's Madison Square explaining the significance of that short-lived promise. Just a few decades later, African American men were breaking down barriers in our nation's military, answering a call during a time when our society was deeply divided along racial lines. Surprisingly, few have even heard of the Montfort Point Marines and the sacrifices they made for our country. Now we share the story of one of those pioneering patriots. On June 1, 1942, during the height of World War II, thousands of African American men from across the country flocked to recruiting offices, eager to serve in the United States Marines. Wherever Mark Gilbert came to Beach High School and asked that all of us who are eligible to try to get in the Marine Corps or in the Navy. John White was one of them. Each, each and every one of us was so gung-ho, we didn't care where we were from. Prior to that time, blacks were not allowed into the Marines, but an executive order from President Franklin Roosevelt changed that. They would break the final color barrier in the military, though their service was initially unwelcome. These new recruits weren't sent to traditional boot camps, but underwent basic training at Montford Point, a segregated facility at Camp Lejeune, North Carolina. In May, we were sent to Paris at Montford Point, which at that time was nothing but woods, snakes, and bears, and swamp. So we re rebuilt uh, Montford Point. They served in all black units afterwards. And I was in the 44th uh, platoon, 32 people in, a, in each platoon. White dedicated a total of 34 months to the Marine Corps, 24 of those overseas. We were not in combat 
uh, because we were the defense battalion, we relieved the uh, other units who was in combat. Though he never fought on the battlefield, the 89-year-old remembers the conflicts he and his comrades faced back at home. I know one uh, fellow who went to Statesboro, and when he came home, he was put in jail uh, because he claimed it, no blacks was in the Marine Corps. White finished his tour as one of the first contemporary U.S. Marines, a pioneer in the armed forces. Unlike other African-American units, such as the Air Force's Tuskegee Airmen or the Army's Buffalo Soldiers, the Montford Point Marines never had a prominent place in history until June 27, 2012. Seventy years after enlisting, White and more than 400 other Montford Point Marines gathered in Washington, D.C. for a ceremony where they were recognized with the nation's highest civilian honor, the Congressional Gold Medal. It's a day he says he never thought he'd see. Pomp and circumstance for service that for so long seemingly went unnoticed. Now forever anchored in the history of our nation's military. To all of us, it was tremendous. And we are proud that we did what we did as young men, not knowing that we would somehow be recognized later in life. About 20,000 African-American Marines passed through training at Montford Point from 1942 to 1949. By the way, Mr. White is also the sole survivor of the original nine, Savannah's first African-American police officers. We'll be right back. When it comes to the fight for justice in Savannah, the name Shin Hoster has become synonymous with civil rights. In particular, three brothers, born and raised on the city's west side, who entered the battle when they were only boys. There's Richard, the oldest, who is now the first vice president of the local chapter of the NAACP. George, the middle, who made local history when he helped integrate Chatham County Public Schools. But it was the youngest, Earl, who had such an impact on society that his efforts to achieve equality would gain international attention and ultimately create a lasting legacy both here and abroad. He was considered one of our community's brightest stars. Protecting the right to vote and the exercise of full citizenship rights is an essential element in America's democratic process. Earl Schenhoster dedicated more than 30 years to the NAACP, a foot soldier in the struggle who worked his way through the ranks to become a part of the organization's national leadership. Those who knew him best say he was totally committed to freedom's cause, a calling his brother Richard says was answered when he was just a kid. At an early age, we knew that, that he was uh, he was different. Uh, while he, he ran with the boys, he always had an interest in, in, in what the world might have to offer and how he could be a part of it. He found his niche by following in the footsteps of his brothers. While Richard was the oldest, it was George who proved to be his biggest inspiration. We talked, and my dad would always have us around talking, so when I came back home, I would be able to sit there and talk about what had transpired and I didn't realize how much Earl was listening. Uh, I'd been involved with the NAACP, the Chatham County Crusade for Voters, and uh, Mr. Law was a very integral part of my decision in going to Groves, our decision. And as a result, uh, in talking about Mr. Law, Earl joined the Youth Council at 13. That was in 1963, a watershed year for the movement. Earl helped organize and galvanize other young people for change which quickly became his life's work. After high school, he entered Morehouse College in Atlanta, graduating with a degree in political science. He thought he wanted to be a lawyer and uh, went to uh, Cleveland, Ohio uh, to enter Cleveland uh, State Law School, but became involved with the local NAACP there because there was a need for a prisons program for the NAACP to work with people who were incarcerated. He left Cleveland and returned to Georgia in 1975 to briefly work with then Governor George Busby. From there, he was called to become regional director of the NAACP, overseeing seven states and several hundred branches. He remained there for 17 years until he was tapped by Benjamin Hooks to be a part of his team. 
1994, he replaced Benjamin Chavis in the top position as acting executive director and CEO. It wasn't long, though, before Earl's work stretched abroad to the continent of Africa. During the time of the uh, release from prison of Nelson Mandela, Earl was commissioned through Andy Young and some others to go to South Africa and to help them establish uh, the voting rights, uh, voting process for newly freed people, people who were being freed from apartheid. I think part of his legacy would be that he was never selfish. He always thought was what is, what is for the greater good. In Savannah, there are several reminders of Earl Schenhoster's life. A monument sits in the Carver Heights community he once called home. The Earl T. Schenhoster Youth Leadership Institute was established five years ago to rekindle his spirit of conviction in a younger generation. In the Ralph Mark Gilbert Civil Rights Museum, a room dedicated in his honor. And just north of the business he and his brother planned to open before his death, a flyover that bears his name. But the family has decided in order to continue honoring Earl's legacy, they'd like to see that flyover removed to reconnect the people in a place he worked to bring together. On June 11, 2000, Earl Schenhoster was killed in a car accident near Montgomery, Alabama. In 2001, the SELC's Women's Organizational Movement for Equality Now erected a memorial and dedicated the stretch of Interstate 85 where he died as the Earl T. Schenhoster Parkway. Stay with us. We'll be right back. They were both feared and revered in some cultures. Their skills in metalworking were even considered a form of magic in Western Africa. Although African-American blacksmiths were not uncommon once upon a time, today they're nearly non-existent. Here now is a story of a local man whose mission is to change that by breathing new life into an art he says is quickly fading away. You don't see many around anymore. In fact, some even say they're a dying breed. Gilbert Walker is a modern day blacksmith, a craft he acquired through simple curiosity. Well, I was working with Savannah uh, Police Department at the time and uh, I was riding my horse uh, Lincoln and I came to Bryan Street and there was a shop that was open, a garage door and uh, there was a guy inside and I could hear the sound of a, a the pinging sound of an anvil. That guy was John Boyd Smith, a celebrated artist internationally recognized for his ironwork. I was fascinated by the fact that he could bend the metal with the fire. And that pinging, well, that would become a part of Walker's weekend ritual. A makeshift shop in his mother's backyard is where he does most of his metal work, gates and fences and what have you. He calls this one a fish out of water. I got this idea because of the fact that as we grew up in this neighborhood, in the East Van neighborhood, we would spend our times in the marshes, the guys that I grew up with. And we would go fishing, we would go crabbing, you know, we'd bring bushels of crab and fish back into this yard and we'll ball and fry them. So basically, I'm bringing back certain memories of my childhood. Walker, who's not only an artist but a historian, also reflects upon his ancestry. Dressed in period clothes, he pays homage to his forefather. Back in the 1800s, uh, you had soldiers, blacksmith soldiers, who traveled with their units. So sometimes you'll see me in a different hat and a buffalo soldier uniform. And his African heritage. I like to incorporate a lot of African uh, proverbs. And basically these symbols, which are called Ndenka symbols, uh, are African proverbs. Once upon a time, there were hundreds of blacksmiths imported from Africa as slaves because of their skills. Today, he says, there are few African-American blacksmiths still around, although his research did lead him to Philip Simmons, a famed blacksmith out of Charleston, South Carolina, whose work appeared in the Smithsonian. Walker had the pleasure of meeting him before he passed away. I learned that um, most of the art that he did stem out of necessity. Um, during the turn of the century, when horse and buggy was gone and automobiles started coming in, you know, it basically put him out of a job and uh, he started doing his artwork. Many blacksmiths, as they were from slavery on to the industrial age, you don't find them anymore. It's Walker's goal to change that. In fact, he hopes through combining history and art, he can spark someone else's curiosity 
and perhaps inspire others to not only appreciate the past, but preserve it. We want to thank you for joining us in celebrating Georgia's Black History Journey. I'm Kim Gusby.